walking man inside. <laughs> All right. Uh, Brian sends $15 and simply says, greetings from Germany. Heck yeah, a classic. I love it. <laughs> All right, so I think we're ready. So it's time to catch the wave. It's Coca-Cola Kid with Gruntmeister and Sharif. Let's go. What is going on, everyone? Welcome to Coca-Cola Kid. It's going to be a race between Gruntmeister and Sharif. And these runners have got quite close times, so we could see a really close race there. And um, I have a co-commentator here with me. Do you want to introduce yourself, Django Storm? Yeah, my name is uh, Django Storm. I'm the only other uh, Dutch runner of this game. Of course, uh, Callum Ball is the world record holder of this game, so uh, we're going to be uh, commentating this uh, very, very quick race. Yeah, so if the runners are ready uh, for a countdown, then I'm happy to give it. All right. Yep. Um, I'm pretty reset. I'm at a, a screen. We'll just reset once just to get to... Yep, just let me know when you're both ready and I'll, I'll give you a can of Coke. I'm just going to open up this can of Coke real fast here. All right. Totally <laughs> done. Got to stay on brand. Enjoy Coca-Cola. All right. <laughs> Ooh, that was delicious. It's 45. All right. <laughs> I'm ready. Good luck, both. All right. Um, you both good? Yep. Just, uh, yep. Go for it. All righty. So let's start in three, two, one, go. Good luck. So Coca-Cola Kid. It's a Game Gear game, and it's a Japanese exclusive game too, so it's two for one on the rarity scale. And this game actually borrows very heavily from Sonic Chaos, if any of you have played that game. So you might recognize some of the sound effects, some of the movement and stuff, so they borrow a lot from that game, it's the same developer. And right away you'll see the runners are dashing a lot, and that's the fastest form of movement, is using a dash. And you can also um, maintain your um, dashing speed by doing a jump. So if you want to just dash, on the ground, um, it would run out quite quickly, but the runners want to be airborne as long as possible to, to be able to maintain that. And also you can bounce off enemies and stuff to further maintain that and keep them here. So uh, the first part here is downtown, and they're just <laughs> blitzing through it right now. And you'll notice there's going to be some slight routing differences throughout the run as well. Like um, There's a lot of like variability in the ways you can go and like safe stretch you can do in this game. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess you could say that this is uh, the game's equivalent of the spin dash in the, the Sonic games. You also saw uh, Sharif just pick up a skateboard, uh, which uh, would normally be also a fast strat, but we're technically not really using it in this run, because the spin dash, or uh, whatever you could call it, is a lot faster. Yeah, the dash attack or the dash movement is just so fast and so overpowered, really, that we just use it as much as possible. And another thing to note is you just want to jump out of uh, the dash as fast as you can, just to keep all of that speed with you. And you can also do a kick on the ground, too. You'll notice some of the runners will sometimes do a kick to um, extend their time um, charging forward. And that's really useful in sections where there's, say, a thin corridor that you can't really jump through. They'll do a kick to extend the length of the, the dash. Really. So Sharif so is was... already on to Central Park, and Grubmice is getting there as well. The first boss was a really quick kill. And uh, yeah, you'll see a lot of uh, yeah further spin dashing. Also notable is that you cannot use it on stairs. You can use it on ramps as such, but stairs somehow uh, don't allow you to use a spin dash. Yep, uh, it doesn't matter if you jump upstairs, walk upstairs, it's the exact same amount of time, so you just gotta deal with it and just walk up. Um, and then, we could, didn't, forgot to mention it there, I was kind of over, glossed over it, but that was the first boss. It went by so quick that you might have even missed it. But um, yeah, yeah, the first boss, you just mash on it and it's down, but later on, some of the bosses have a lot more RNG elements. And it could actually um, sway the race, like say someone's in the lead a little bit, it could get much worse RNG, because the RNG does differ quite a bit if you get unlucky. By the time we get to the third level, uh, we can definitely see some interesting changes in the race for sure. We'll have to find out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the title bosses, as I call it, is uh, definitely a big game changer. Yeah, that's like several seconds worth of variability, right? Um, I think it's like 20 seconds, like best plus, maybe even more than that. It's definitely the biggest um, differential in the game. So Sharif is on like... the second boss right now. Uh, it's also one of those bosses that can be killed relatively quickly, but you have to wait a little bit longer for the sticks to be thrown. But ideally, you would want to take out the boss on the right side, basically. So as soon as you see any sort of uh, animation pop up, you know, you try to uh, kick him and kick him off to the right side of the screen. Yeah, the second boss is also deterministic. Like, there's not really any randomness to it. I think there might be some difference in um, where the projectiles are thrown, but where this boss is going to spawn is the same every time. So it's really easy to, to route it out and hopefully get through it without any uh, mishaps. But the next boss. The only downside if it's cast to the left. 
Yeah. Ooh, that's a, that's really bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're currently on the ruins on Sharif's side. Um, Sharif is taking a somewhat safer route, which allows for a couple of extra life pickups, which obviously is good for marathon safety. It's a little bit of a slower route, however, uh, but you do get up to the regular route relatively quickly still. And the level that uh, Grandmaster's on right now is a level where lag comes into play quite a lot, especially if you go the top route, like um, they're often to. And the lag in this game can be so strong in certain sections that your inputs just will not go through. So we just have to kind of pray a lot of the time that the inputs get red and we don't just, you know, fall off uh, without doing a jump or something. And it looks oh. like it's going good. So. Yeah. Like, that was a great level. Yeah, yeah. that was good. <clears throat> also, uh, uh, jumping up these uh, small platform blocks is. Uh, Pretty tough because you really have to do your jump uh, as soon as possible after you initiate the spin dash. Which, by the way, you can do by holding down and then pressing the kick button. Uh, that's a way to set up uh, for the dash. Well, the, that's one of the two buttons, basically. Yeah, you also have to be stationary when you're doing your boost. You can't do this boost whilst you're moving. So, in a way, you kind of go slow to go fast at times. You have to optimize slowing down to then be able to go fast again doing another boost. level uh, basically a couple of places where you wind up uh, falling down really there's all kinds of uh, routes you can take just like uh, in the sonic games um usually uh well this is uh, the fastest uh, route here you can see on uh Shara's stream he took a different route for that level where he's sliding through that um corridor oh yeah i take a much slower route on the room in the ruins i never learned the right strat for this yeah, it was too hard <laughs> it was too right, hard so so how how this title boss works is it will have movements of two left to right. It always finishes on the right side, so we'll either have two movements, four movements, six nice. movements, or eight movements. That was a very good amount of luck so far. Oh wow! Perfect again. So it's been um, second best, best, wow. best, and then best. Pattern. Wow. Yeah. Let's wow. See what so you got all the gets. Terrible already. Mm, so far, yeah, that a little lucky. So, yeah, so I think it's a maximum of four cycles that you can get uh, on each right. uh, possible hit. Yep. So it's three and three. Yeah. That was a good one. All right, steel factory didn't be good. Yeah, Grandmeister is uh, currently on the Steel Factory, and this is one of the few levels where you actively use uh, the slide mechanic, which I'm pretty sure you don't use really anywhere else in the game. Yes, it's one of the, yeah. the few sections where you just have, you can only use that to get through that gap. Whereas other levels, it's kind of like a different round where you can maybe have to use it. This is where the game definitely starts to ramp up in difficulty no. around these levels. Yeah, I love these uh, jumps that you see right here on the drum side. Uh, th those are definitely scary. I, I know that from uh, my own experience. Uh, it can be tough if you uh, wind up falling down. You have to recover from that. That was a, that was a very good backup, though. Like, very good awareness of like what the level's like below that point. Because normally you wouldn't go down that far. But drum the back to the pub. So that was, that was very very good. Okay, so area Still minor two. Time, yes. Area 2, this is uh, a thing that the test note writes about what a GDQ commentator would say. Basically, this is a pretty straightforward stage with a few pretty precise movements. So there's your direct quote right there. There you go. And yeah, it's a, it's a level with uh, some more scary jumps. Uh, kind of similar to what you see in the first part as well. Oh, there's another mechanic here where it's uh, sliding down walls as well. So if you push up against the wall, you actually slide on it quite slowly. That's very useful in sections like that, where you want to get into a small gap. You'll see it as well quite a bit on the final one. We're not still only separated by about a level. It's, it's still pretty close, and the RNG in the final boss is still way up. This is definitely an opportunity for things it's to It's not over yet. There's, there's going to be some uh, interesting uh, sections coming up still. Disco is still coming up. So this boss is also random, but it's not as bad as the other one. So there's three different patterns. Um, okay. The best one, the second one, which only loses one second, and then the third, but the worst pattern, which loses five seconds. So I think Ramaster got the best pattern, though. one of the best. But it didn't seem too snappy, so not good. There's also the this opening uh, attack that you can do as well, which also uh, sort of uh, gives you a bit of an advantage as well, before you start to fight proper. Yeah, that's true. There's a few bosses where you can get an early hit in on them. And then the rest of this pattern is just um, straightforward. It's the same thing every time. The only time it's going to change is if you take a couple seconds to hit them, then they start uh, rolling into a ball again, and you can't hit them for that whole period. To, uh, to clarify uh, from the, the comment in chat, I got that RNG. Uh, we're both playing on original hardware, for the record. I want everyone to know that. Yeah. Yeah, props to the runners for uh, getting this set up. It, it must be very difficult to get to actually capture from a, the handheld like that, so respect for that. Definitely. 
some Game Gear boarding involved and such, yeah. Yeah, yeah Grump is on the final level actually uh, in the Disco stage, and yeah, there's uh, still some uh, difficult sections to go, so uh, we'll see uh, how that uh, treats uh, both of the runners. And uh, there's some really good gems in there, so uh, you can get yourself these out if you like. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, there's going to be some uh, tough sections for sure. Yeah, there's uh, definitely the hardest levels in the run for sure, I see. Yeah, the difficulty really ramps up in uh, Disco. Yeah. And there's a, you see there, there's like kind of a secret wall you, you could break. And there's a lot of secret walls in these last few stages. Like, some of them are pretty hard to find casually, actually. So, you'll see some, some skips here that you might not find in a casual playthrough. Yeah, so Area 2 in Disco, um, it seems like the route they're taking actually sort of involves a skip, but I think it's sort of like the official route that you have to take. It's kind of an obtuse one, but um, yeah, as soon as you know where it is, then, you know. Yeah, it does, it does kind of make sense the way it lines up at the end of the stage, because you'd have to do some pretty precise wall jumps otherwise to get up there, so I guess it doesn't make sense to just contend with some of these definitely aren't. There's like different ones you can go for them as well as more shortcuts here. Yeah. Uh, there is another way to get through Disco 2, but it's really, really long and hard to find. Yeah, and some I of didn't the know, official, actually. Some of the official uh, path, uh, paths in this uh, level are uh, way harder than the speedrun actually uh, goes for. So Grumpmeister is currently going to uh, break this wall open, and uh, this is actually, uh, well, it's sort of a different route, but it's actually safer than the official route that you can take, which involves you heading further down below, and uh, you have to avoid certain gaps. So, yeah. And Grumpmeister did a really good job at it, uh, doing it very quickly. So, yeah, that's already uh, off to the final boss, and it's time for some uh, more RNG. Yep, so um, the strategy here is you want to try and hit them right in the middle of the stage as they're floating down, and if you get lucky on the pattern, which they didn't get sadly so far, um, the, the, hit, the hit will connect with them in the middle of the stage, but all the other patterns, they'll kind of jump around the screen and, and waste some time if you can. Let's see if, if we get any hits through here. Yeah, uh, really time is coming up shortly for Grommeister, by the way. Uh, as soon as uh, he deals the fourth hit, fourth hit that's going to be uh, time for uh, Grommeister. Yep. I'll try and be eagle eyed and count uh, go oh, on. Yeah. So it shouldn't be I one want to hit. have one quick hit. <laughs> <laughs> Please go last hit. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Okay, Sharif is also getting to the final stage. Time. That's time. <laughs> and that's time for Grubmeister. GG. Very nice run. Thank you. The power of Biscuit. Yeah, Indeed. Biscuit of Flurry here. Yeah, good boys. Sure, we're gonna help out behind the door energy. coming into the final boss too. So we'll see if we can get some different patterns here. There we go. Perfect. First That's a very good so, uh, first round. Yeah, so if, the if, they don't if you miss that hit, then it's actually really bad. It like lags the whole screen. Wow. Getting real good luck so far. That's two out of four, right? Yeah. Wow. Oh, this wow. is the best RNG you can possibly get so far. So that's good. I'm glad I wasted on a run where I died. It ruins one. I called it. That was time. perfect RNG. <laughs> that's GG for Sharif. Awesome last fight. <laughs> GG, Sharif. Yeah, good job, everyone. GG, man. Enjoy some Coca Cola here. <laughs> yeah. Celebration. Enjoy Coca Cola. <laughs> Stay hydrated. <laughs> it's very important. Ah. It's fun. And now we yeah. got very um, um, typical Japanese uh, ending credits. Um, the, the translation doesn't uh, tell that much, but uh, yeah, you make a, you make up your mind about what's happening, I guess. <laughs> he's, he's he's actually he's because he's suffocating on something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's what's happening. Yeah. Uh, um, if I like to interrupt for a moment, like I really want to uh, thank both of uh, Callum and uh, Jangle here for commentating this race. Like this race, sure, the, the game on its own is fast paced enough as it is, and having two people run at the same time, it's an absolute mess. So, uh, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, doing that. Uh, Sharif, for also uh, accepting the race invite. Like, I saw that he um, submitted this to GDQ, and I was also contemplating doing it. So, uh, I was like, whether he wants to uh, race it. At that point, our PBs were exactly the same, like on the yep. second. 11.51. <laughs> so, yep. I remember. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, of course, also uh, thanks to GTQ for uh, accepting uh, the race as it is. Um, I've had the blast doing it uh, myself. Um, I'll, as a quick shout out for, for myself, uh, like, I've been Grandmeister. Uh, if you <laughs> like to see uh, uh, Sega Game Gear shenanigans, I'll be playing a bit more uh, throughout the month uh, for Ninja Gaiden. I'll uh, do some Ninja Gaiden on the Game Gear. 
And uh, other than that, uh, I'll just uh, bring Sharif. Anything you want to uh, mention still? Uh, yeah, you can find me on twitch.tv slash sharfers. Um, I also just run weird, obscure garbage like Grump does as well. Um, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm working through running as many Barbie games as I can and as many FMV games as I can. But I've been... Um, but yeah, that's... Yeah, that's... <laughs> Yeah, and and Grum, thanks for reaching out. This is I, I I actually really like races. This is my third GDQ run, but in my second GDQ race, I'm always up for a race. So. <laughs> a lot of fun. Not gonna lie, yeah, I was incredibly nervous us. at start. <laughs> As uh, Callum may have <laughs> this noticed, this is a hard game. This is a hard game. This was my first race in a marathon ever. But it was <laughs> oh, wow, fun. I'm glad. I'm your first. All right, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I actually do run Wirehead. Anyway, yeah, no, that was that was a lot of fun. Thanks for having us. Uh, yeah, Jungle, thank Callum, you. Thanks for. Uh, Yes, for Thanks again. If Callum and Jingle say have anything? Uh, uh, no. Uh, you you go first, uh, Callum. <laughs> um, <laughs> nah, I was just I was just gonna say great run, everybody. Um, and I'm just happy to be able to provide some commentary for this game. I would did the game proud, and uh, that's it. Yeah, also, uh, yeah, thanks again uh, for the for the race. That was really awesome to watch, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me on uh, co-commentary. Uh, that was uh, a fun race to uh, co-commentate for, and uh, enjoy. Cheers. All right, we are back. Thank you so much. That was a very awesome race of Coca-Cola Kid. You didn't think you were, there was going to be a race of Coca-Cola Kid, but there was, and it was awesome. So thank you, Gruntmeister and Sharif. That was amazing. So back to some donations. <laughs> uh, Halfkey sends $5 and says, Doing my part to add to the Dullahan fight $5 train. Loving this race. Never seen this game before. I have to admit, I'm not so much of a Coca-Cola kid. I'm more of a Pepsi man. Also, shout outs to the marble with the screaming head inside. Because <laughs> Dullahan don't got no head. Um... That's right, we're trying to get money. We need $50,000 total for the Dullahan Super Boss fight in Golden, A in Golden Age. Golden Sun. <laughs> Golden Sun, the Lost Age. Thank you. Uh, it's a very difficult Super Boss fight. Uh, we're a little, we're uh, getting close to $7,000. We need $50,000. Let's keep that hype going. Um, let's see, here we go. Harzlek since $25 and says, shout out to the marble with the screaming man inside from Australia. <laughs> See, even Australia supports the marble with the screaming man inside. Good, as they should. Uh, Metanoch sends $50 and says, A shame there is no Super Monkey Ball run planned, so let's see the Dullahan instead. Shout outs to the marble with the screaming man inside. <laughs> yes, <laughs> continue this. Uh... Uh, Barky Beak sends $41 and says the world needs a Coke and more Coca-Cola, kid. Good luck to the runners. All right, and with that, we have uh, Yellow Killer Bee uh, interviewing someone from MSF, so take it away. It's going to be full of some very insightful information, so stick around and check it out. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Summer Games Done Quick 2021. I am joined here today by Jenny Martino. She is do from Doctors Without Borders. She's a field staff there. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, well, we love seeing you guys and hearing more about what you do with Doctors, uh, Doctors Without Borders. So tell me a little bit about what a day in the life of someone who's on field staff does. Okay, so I'm a pulmonary critical care doctor, and I've been with Doctors Without Borders on and off since 2014. Um, I recently came back from Gaza, uh, so I've gone on seven missions where I've worked as a doctor on, <laughs> on all my missions. They varied from like tuberculosis projects to most recently a couple of COVID projects. Mm -hmm. um, my past three missions have actually been COVID missions. Mm -hmm. So a typical day in the life is you get up, you go to the hospital, um, you save a million lives, and I'm saying you. <laughs> of course you do. <laughs> yeah, of course we do. And, and we look beautiful while doing it. You know, right, but, uh, right. And the 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 you know windswept hair goes back, exactly. and everyone's Perfect. like, "Thank yep. you." <laughs> yeah. No, but, and we mm -hmm. uh, we go. We usually round, see patients, talk to the local doctors and nurses, mm -hmm. um, do our work during the day, and then at the end of the day, we go back to our house. 
so my last three missions have been COVID missions. And before that, I actually worked in New York City last April during the huge peak they had there. Um, so I worked there for like four or five months. Mm. Then I've been to Brazil, Lebanon, and Gaza for COVID missions with MSF. Um, and they've been varied from uh, many patients to not so many patients, mm -hmm. but they've all been very intense. Um, one thing I realized is that, you know, COVID is a disease, probably one of the first diseases, at least in my lifetime, that affects like everyone in the entire world. Mm. So pretty much no one's immune from it, whether you're rich or poor, um, no matter where you live, like COVID's unfortunately affected everyone this past year and a half and been a huge part of everyone's lives. So I've had the opportunity to work in New York City, then Brazil, Lebanon, and Gaza dealing with COVID patients. Um, and I think for me, the, the most important thing I've seen is that I've brought my experiences from all the different contexts to each country. And I think it's been really hard for people because so many patients with COVID who end up in the hospital do die. Mm. So I think it's been very reassuring to have someone come from another context and say like, yeah, you know, when I was in New York City, a lot of the patients died too. And I know it's really hard, but we mm. just we just do the best we can. And so for me, I think that's been the most important thing I've brought to the COVID projects mm. is just sharing my experiences and helping them take care of patients. Yeah, that's amazing. And being able to gather from all those different places, which, like you said, each one has its own challenges, I'm sure, but each one is kind of equalized also by dealing with the same disease, you know, whether it be in Gaza or somewhere else. And uh, so how important are those partnerships? Like you talked about working with the local, you know, medical staff, um, you know, how does how important are those partnerships to them? Uh, so... I think it is very important for them. Uh, my first COVID project was in Brazil. And mm -hmm. when I went there, I was working in an ICU that was run by the local hospital. Mm -hmm. And they basically had surgeons, family practice doctors, and other doctors running very sick uh, intubated patients, like patients on life support. Mm -hmm. And so, and a lot of their patients were dying. And so when I came and I'm an ICU doctor and I could provide support for them. It was just having me there. It was like so relieving for them because so many of their patients were dying. And I was like, you know, this happens, people die and we just do the best that we can. And so I think just me being there as like an emotional support and also providing right. medical support was huge for them. Like you could just see like the relief on their faces. Mm -hmm. And even if the patient still died, um, cause obviously like one person can't, <laughs> you right. know, in a, in a big system, I'm not going to sweep in and like save everyone's lives. Right. But even, you know, when people still died, at least I was there telling them, you know, we did everything we could and you guys did a really good job and they do do a really good job. They just need a little extra support. So it, yeah. was, it was pretty, it, it felt very fulfilling for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if this has been a hard time for everybody, but especially for the doctors and nurses and, and everybody who kind of works in that industry, I mean, it's, you kind of have this view of doctors like, oh, they've got everything together. But I mean, it's just as hard for them when they're dealing with something kind of unprecedented like this, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. And COVID's been really interesting because things change so frequently. Mm -hmm. um, like, I've never seen so much research done. And we're learning more every day about mm -hmm. COVID. And so it's, you know, the medical care is changing as, ev as every day goes on, the practice is changing. But to me, it still comes back to the basics, like no matter where you are, like throughout the long run, just like oxygenation, mm -hmm. um, taking good medical care of patients, like that's really what saves the most lives. And you can do that anywhere. So Nice. So, um, I mean, obviously you're a doctor. And so now how long have you been working with MSF? Uh, since 2014. Okay. And I do some work in the United States, and then I go and do international work. So. Nice. So what is different about working with MSF than working like in the, in the private field, in the medical field? So the reason I actually started working with MSF is because I got really sick of <laughs> the medical field, yeah. like uh, being a doctor for money and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And the great thing about Doctors Without Borders is that we help everyone. Mm -hmm. um, like un unequivocally everyone, no matter your religion, no matter your sex, mm -hmm. no matter your beliefs, like we help everyone. And uh, it doesn't matter if you have money, it doesn't matter, none of that matters. And so it's really just taking care of people to take care of people. Yeah. And so that's what I really like about MSF and do working with MSF. I got a little tired of um, yeah. taking care of so many people who just have everything given to them. And yeah. 
you, you go to these other countries and you see people who have to fight for everything and right. food and, and they're still really happy a lot of the times. <laughs> yeah. It kind of gives you a whole new perspective on life. And so for me, it's, it's really important. And I do think I actually gain more when I go on a mission than, than I give. Hopefully I give something, but it does feel like, <laughs> it does feel like I get more in return when I go on a mission. Yeah. So let's talk specifically about Gaza because you just got back like very, very recently. We're actually recording this like the day before, a couple days before the event starts, but you just got back from Gaza. So were there any like specific challenges um, that were unique to that area? Uh, so the specific challenges of Gaza were, well, first I was delayed going because of, um, the fighting, so they mm -hmm. couldn't get, uh, permission to go. Um, and then I arrived, I think in Gaza two days after the fighting had ended. Oh, wow. So of course that's a big emotional, um, upheaval for the entire country. So besides COVID, they also had injuries related to the fighting. So, mm -hmm. um, that was challenging, um, and there was uh, evidence of destruction in the streets, and it, w it was just quite challenging um, from that aspect. Um, mm -hmm. Like somehow COVID didn't seem as important when there were so many <laughs> yeah. other things going on. So mm -hmm. it's amazing how something even like COVID can take a back seat when you know there's it's so tumultuous in a certain area. Yeah, they. You know, I think in, in certain settings. Um, when there's war or mm -hmm. uh, fighting in, in any country, you know, mm -hmm. people forget about coronavirus and COVID. And, yeah. <laughs> and of course, um, other things do take priority. Mm -hmm. For sure. Well, I think it's great that you're able to help out, you know, in the places that need it most to and kind of all over the world. Because, um, I mean, it, it's, it's something that really connects us together, that universality of, of, about needing help and needing that emotional support. I think that's a wonderful thing that you're doing. But I oh, do want to take like a last minute and just talk about the event. Were you familiar with Games Done Quick before you kind of came on with uh, Doctors Without Borders? I would like to say yes, but the answer is no. <laughs> no, I, I, I looked it up when, I, when they told me about it. It seems like a great event. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, thank you guys for supporting Doctors Without Borders because without all the generous donations people give, we wouldn't be able to do the work we do. So mm -hmm. we need everyone. We need doctors. We need support. We need logisticians. We need everyone to do the mm -hmm. work we do. And so thank you to everyone for helping us make that possible. Yeah, and I mean, it's one of those things where you may not have heard of the event, but you were a gamer back in the day. I, I heard someone <laughs> someone told me that uh, that you uh, are not averse to playing some games as a as a younger person. So what what uh, what were some of your favorite games as a kid? So as a kid, definitely Super Mario, Duck Hunt, Legend of Zelda, Tetris. Those are kind of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I remember like racing home from school and trying to. Um, beat my brother upstairs so <laughs> to see who would get to play first. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, my sister was the youngest, so she usually got like <laughs> last place. But yeah, <laughs> I can definitely relate to that. And and I think part of it is like people are like, oh, you're watching other pl people play video games. That's kind of weird. But didn't we all kind of do that as siblings? Because you know, you had to take turns, and you only had one TV, so you ended up watching each other play probably as much as playing anyway. So I think that's part yeah. of the reason it's this natural kind of transition to that. Yeah, we did it before it was like cool to do yeah. that. Like, yeah. we, <laughs> we were the front runners. Let's, let's point yes. that out right now. <laughs> Trailblazers. So uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Dr. Jenny Martino, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for everything you do with Doctors Without Borders. We really appreciate uh, all the, the help that you're giving to other doctors and uh, patients, of course, all over the world. And we just appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. Yeah, well, thank you for the work you guys do and making our work possible. We're all a nice team, so thank you all. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's great to be, you know, able to contribute to what you're doing, and, uh, and we love doing it. So thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for watching. This is Summer Games Done Quick 2021. Make sure to stay tuned for more great runs coming up next. Thank you.